Hey everybody and welcome back to another video. Um, today I wanted to continue our Understanding the Evidence series and uh, intro biases. So this is going to be just the introductory discussion to bias, what bias is, how it can affect studies, and why we need to pay attention to it when we're uh, digesting, understanding, and applying studies. Um, I have some figures and texts here from different uh, papers that look at bias. Uh, they'll be linked in the comments um, as the original creators of said con content. Check out those articles um, for more information and uh, more uh, resources to understand bias. So what is bias? Let's just write it out. Bias, without an S, good start. Let's erase that and spell it out for real. There, that looks better, what is it? So bias is any deviation, all right, whether intentional or not, so intentional or unintentional, from the truth. And the truth is kind of the pure way of understanding the truth, not the truth that you can discover, but the real accurate truth of the matter. So in research, bias is something that we talk about quite frequently because it can be detrimental, right, to a conclusion. If a study has a lot of bias and we don't identify it and we trust the conclusion as is, that conclusion may be incorrect. And if we apply an incorrect conclusion to patient care, Patients can get hurt, right? So the conclusion in a study with lots of bias can have a false positive rate, right? The study finds a positive result that is untrue or a false negative rate. The study finds a negative result that is also not true. In either case, patients suffer. And that's why it's really important to understand bias. And when you're reading a study, um, especially with a positive conclusion, um, to digest where bias may be and what that may mean for the conclusion, all right? So in studies, um, bias usually introduces systematic error, right? So it's a systematic error um, into the sampling, right, the patients being looked at, or the testing, what is being looked at that might help or hurt. It can occur at any point in a study. You know, it's not just in sample sizes or anything. And the fact of the matter is that most studies have some form of biased bias. It's something that's fairly unavoidable um, given the nature of scientific and medical studies. So when we're looking at clinical research, the major sources of bias can occur at any point in the study, right? So we have trial planning, we have trial implementation, and we have data analysis and publication. And you can see here, they kind of go over a few of the possible biases. So the pre-trial bias, there could be a flawed study design. You could have selection bias. Selection bias is a big one. Sampling bias is a subset of that, but choosing the patients in the treatment groups. You could have channeling bias, and we'll go over all these in future videos. Within the trial itself, there could be interviewing bias, right? You could have predisposed notions that can um, modulate how you approach things as an interviewer. Recall bias. If a study is asking patients to recall certain aspects, those patients may recall them differently. Let's say that a patient, uh, you're looking at you know, smoking and lung cancer. You ask patients who don't have lung cancer how much they smoked, and you ask patients that do have lung cancer how much they smoked. The recall bias between those two groups may be different. One, those who didn't smoke may, or those who don't have lung cancer may think that they had smoked less than they really did. Or maybe the other way around, those that had lung cancer felt bad and they reported smoking less than they really did. There can be recall bias, right? You can misclassify your groups, exposures and outcomes, performance bias, um, and then in analysis and publication, confounding, right? We talk about confounding variables all the time. Confounding bias is something important. So I want to kind of just go over, uh, we'll go over this text, and then we're going to go over kind of the different areas of bias in a trial. So we talked about this a little bit already. Bias is any trend or deviation from the truth in data collection, data analysis, 
interpretation, and publication. It can lead to false conclusions, whether those are false positive or false negative. It can be intentional or unintentional. The intention to introduce bias into someone's research is immoral, right? That's terrible. No one should ever do it. Nevertheless, there are consequences of bias research, and it's equally irresponsible to conduct and publish a bias research study unintentionally. For that reason, it is important to point out biases as a research author if you find biases in your own research. It's worth pointing out that every study has its confounding variables and limitations. That's normal. The confounding effect cannot be completely avoided. Every scientist should therefore be aware of all potential sources of bias and undertake all possible actions to reduce and minimize the deviation from the truth. If deviation is still present, authors should confess it in their articles by declaring the known limitations of their work. The problem is that this doesn't always happen. Right? Whether it's because the authors don't realize there's bias or because they do and they intentionally suppress the bias to, you know, try to make their study look stronger or have a more powerful result, this does not always happen. And that's why as readers, we need to understand what bias is, where bias may be, and then detect that bias. Okay? So the first thing we kind of talked about, data collection. So in data collection, there are many opportunities for bias to occur, right? So the goal of data collection is to have a representative sample. But what does that mean? What is a representative sample? Well, a representative sample is a sample that represents the entire population of interest, right? So if that is... You know, you're doing a study looking at um, breast cancer in women old, above the age of 50. In a perfect study, you would include every single female above the age of 50 with breast cancer. That would be your entire population, right? But that's obviously not feasible. So what you have to do is try to design a study that has a representative sample of that population. That's what studies do. The challenge is while doing this, you can introduce biases, such as selection or sampling bias, right? That is when you have that population, that sample population, and it does not represent the actual entire population, right? Um, admission bias is another form of that. Um, and this is common because a lot of studies happen in the hospital. So those are only with patients admitted. And if you're doing a study on only patients admitted, unless the study population is focused deliberately on patients who are hospitalized, you have admission bias because that can drive the results because the only population you're looking at are those admitted to the hospital. Also, volunteer bias. Uh, many studies ask for volunteers to enroll. Um, that produces bias as well. Are those volunteers all healthy, all young? Um, are those volunteers someone who takes control of their health and that's why they're volunteering? All that can bias studies. You have survivor bias. Um, in some studies, you're um, looking at a certain subset of popu a certain subset of the population, um, but if that study is kind of a long study, some of that population may die. And if it dies, if that some subset of the population dies and you don't include that in your study, then you're only going to have the survivors and that can screw the data as well. Misclassification bias. We just misclassify the sample uh, population and it's not representative. Okay. So those are just a few examples of different data collection biases. And this is where we see a lot of uh, bias come through. You know, in uh, a lot of the COVID videos we've been doing going over papers, I don't think I, I do a good enough job of talking about selection bias. I'll talk about well-matched groups, but then is that overall group representative of the population that we're interested in? I think that's something that I could do a better job of um, when talking about papers in the future. All right. So, the next area of bias, data analysis. So we collected the data, now we're analyzing it. There's actually uh, plenty of areas for bias in data collection as well. Why is that? Well, you must analyze your intended data. And intended is a, a word deliberately chosen. So when you're analyzing data, 
or when you're setting up a study, you identify the population you're going to look at, and you must then analyze data from that population that you identified before the study. Uh, I forgot to put identified. Uh, intended data identified before the study. The reason being is because if you only analyze um, the data of uh, individuals who complete the study at the end, you might miss certain caveats of um, uh, the original population. So for instance, if you set up a study, you enroll 100 patients, and let's say the study is looking at um, quitting smoking. You enroll 100 patients who smoke, and you're trying a counseling therapy to see if it's successful to get them to quit. With that, you have 30 patients that drop out of the study before the end of it. So you have 70 or yeah, 70 patients left. Of those 70, 60 quit smoking. 60 out of 70 quit smoking. But the 30 patients that dropped out did not quit smoking, right? Because they didn't like the counseling sessions. So if I say 60 out of 70 quit smoking, my success is going to look much more robust than if I say 60 out of 100. So you must analyze the intended data, the data you identified before the study. Because if I only analyze 60 out of 70, I miss 30% of my patients that did not quit smoking. And that's going to skew the result to make it look more impressive than it is. All right. So the name of some of these biases in data analysis, one, you can just straight fabricate data, falsify data. And that is something we saw in the COVID study with Surgisphere. Well, I should say theoretically, at least, I think they're still teasing it out a little bit. Um, another thing that people do is they eliminate outliers to make their data look more uniform, right? If someone has a data point that is far away from all the other data points, some authors will eliminate that outlier and that can skew the data as well. The other thing is inappropriate statistics, right? Statistics is a tremendously complex field and you can use statistics to um, gain different uh, conclusions, statistics. And if those statistics are inappropriate, you might get an inappropriately positive result. Um, a quote I came across um, that is uh, in one of the links in the comments um, is, if you torture data long enough, I'm going to write it out because I like it that much, long enough, it will confess to anything. And this is true, and it's... I think a good example, we, uh, anything, we put out that study on, or that video on p-values. And part of that video, you know, we talked about the p-value equals 0 0.05, which means that there's only a 5% chance that that is a random result. And we say that that's statistically significant. Well, if we, for our data analysis, analyze 20 different things, 20 different variables or outcomes. By sheer statistics and math, one of those 20 will have a p-value of 0 0.05, even if all 20 of the outcomes are negative. So we would have this falsely statistically significant outcome because we analyze so many different outcomes that one of them is just coincidentally positive. If we then just publish this one and we don't publish any of the other 19, so no one knows that we studied 20 different outcomes, it'll look like we have this positive study, even though realistically we just analyzed a bazillion different things, tortured that data, and made it confess to one positive result, even though that positive result is more, more likely just random change chance because we studied so many different things. All right. All right. Then a few quicker ones. We're getting towards the end here. Data interpretation. So we analyzed our data. Uh, now we interpret it. Interpretation. That seems right. So when we're interpreting data, um, something that we're going to do another video on, because I think it's important, is whether it is clinically meaningful. And this essentially means, is the result something that makes a clinical difference? If I'm saying their white count is one point higher, one point lower, does that really affect clinical outcomes? Maybe, probably not though. Um, also, mistaking causality for correlation. So 
saying that one thing caused another thing, even though it was just correlated, and the study wasn't set up to find causality, so making false causality claims. Extrapolating data, so our study population is all females above the age of 90, then extrapolating that result to apply to 50-year-old males, all that can lead to biases, and it's things that we see in studies every day, um, so it's things we have to keep in mind when we're you know, digesting and interpreting those studies. And then the last thing, which is just quick, is publication, right? So we gathered our data, we analyzed our data, we interpreted our data, and now we're publishing it. The fact of the matter is, journals are more likely to publish positive results. And that leads to a huge publication bias, right? Because there might be three papers with negative results, and then they publish the one with positive results. Some journals are better than other journals at doing this. Um, but it's something to keep in mind that, uh, you know, journals are more likely to publish positive results. Um, in the COVID literature, though, we've seen that a lot of journals have maintained, you know, um, the good practice of publishing both positive and negative results. All right, so that was kind of an intro to biases. We're going to be doing some other videos in the uh, Understanding the Evidence series on specific biases, but I wanted to uh, kind of lay the groundwork for that. So I hope you all enjoyed. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Feel free to subscribe or that bell button to follow along, and we will see you all next time.